Shall I just say a quick prayer? Heavenly Father, we ask that in this time where there's so many things to think about, in this world of great need, that we, your people, would hear your word this morning to us, that we might know you are God as our sustainer, as our hope, and that we might reflect that hope in the way we live our lives in this community and in the world around us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on uh, Remembrance Sunday, Isaiah 55, if you like, is a bit of a call-up. There are call-up papers from God. I say that because of the note of command here. If you look down to verse 1, there's this sort of command to come. Uh, verse 3, give ear, come. Uh, there's also a note of urgency if you look at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Now, don't get too concerned as I highlight that. Uh, what are we invited to? What are we called to come to? Something wonderful. Using the war analogy, um, the invitation is to a victory parade. The fighting has already uh, been uh, finished. Uh, that was last week, Isaiah 53. The victory was won by Jesus and now you and I are invited to join the victory that Jesus has won. Come, says the Lord our God. So that's how we'll work through this chapter. We'll look at the three instructions or commands uh, from God, the three invitations that uh, we see in verse 1, come, uh, verses 2 and 3, listen, and verse uh, 6, seek. So first of all, verse 1, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come by and eat. All of us get physically hungry and thirsty. All of us get spiritually thirsty and soul hungry too. For satisfaction, for significance and for security. We need all of those things. And Isaiah, he, he spent chapter after chapter exposing the way that the people back then turned to idolatry. They made physical idols uh, and they worshipped those things instead of seeking God for satisfaction, for security, and for significance. And we've been reflecting on the way that we do the same whenever we take something good that God has given, uh, whether it's, uh, I don't know, something, something that God's given us to enjoy. I don't know, it could be something like a work that we enjoy. It could be something like a, a, a loving family. It could be physical health and looks while they last. It, fitness, having money, spending, popularity, having nice, anything good that God has given. And we make that our number one in our lives, in life, the center of everything, that we sacrifice everything else around it to get that thing because we believe it'll give us satisfaction or significance or security. That's modern idolatry. And the craziness of living that way is exposed in verses 1 and 2. If you look down, there's a sort of picture there of um, going down Portobello Road, uh, and I'm sure we can imagine this, going down on a hot, sunny day. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, your credit card is maxed out, and you are hungry and you are thirsty. And you see this incredible store. There seems to be an unending supply of water. There's milk. There's um, wine. There's the richest of fare, is what it says. There's fantastic food. There is God himself calling to the crowds, Come, all you who are thirsty. And you think... I've gone, uh, come all you who have no money and you think oh okay I'm interested but as we well know God's voice is not the only one we hear in life 
And there are lots of other voices around us too, clamoring for our attention and trying to get us to buy what they offer. So verse 2, you rummage in your pocket and you find there's a tenner there and you, and you see something on one of the other stands and, and you think, oh, well, the packaging looks good. I'll, 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 just, I'll just have one. I'll go that later. I'll, I'll just have one of these. And, and you rip open the packet and you put it in your mouth and uh, it's not bread. Uh, verse 2. You can't eat it. And you've opened it now. You're not getting your money back. In a world full of options, not all options are equal. Not all voices are true. In fact, there is only one option, knowing God, that will bring the satisfaction, the significance, the security that our souls yearn for. Because you and I are made for a relationship with the God who made us and who loves us. And who calls us to himself. That's what Isaiah is saying. Come. And that's why you see here, uh, uh, God is appealing to the Israelites. They're still in exile at this point. And God's saying, don't forget the promises I've made. Don't just simply settle down and make a life for yourself in Babylon. Remember to come back when you can come back from exile. After Jesus came into the world, God is saying this to the world because he's the one through whom God will save all the nations. And notice, uh, I don't know whether he did or when we read through it, it isn't just God calling to the world, to us, to you and me. It's also God reasoning with us. That's the whole thing, this, port, this market sort of picture in verses 1 and 2. And, and the question of verse 2, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Why would you do that? Why invest your time, your money, your talents, your youth? Why sacrifice your health, your relationships for any of the idolatries of the human heart? Why do that? We can, can't we? God's given us choice, but why, why, why would we? Why, why do we? There's a clue, I think, in verse 2, why we do end up opting for idolatry. It's in the word labor. God has made human beings, you and me, so that actually it's good to have a goal and to work and labor towards that target. That's a good thing. It just gets distorted when the goal becomes everything in our lives, the center of everything in our lives, the one thing that we must have. So let's run that. You, you make yourself a goal. Make, uh, you, making a name for yourself, being remembered, being recognized. Maybe you make that your goal. And you go after it in the old-fashioned way, by a career, or, or in the new way, by Instagram. Supposing you achieve your goal, you make a name for yourself. Supposing there's a statue of you somewhere in London in 200 years' time. What have you achieved, ultimately? What have you got at the end of it all? Does it satisfy your soul? See, the world doesn't revolve around you or me. We're guests of God's reality. And so it's when he's number one in our lives. Everything else that's good in our lives fits in its right place. And maybe you will be remembered in 200 years' time. But that's a bonus. That's not what life's about. So come, God says, come, buy, and eat. Come without money and without cost. Some people hesitate on the brink of becoming Christians or, or else they hesitate from really being wholehearted in their commitment to Jesus because they think, well, you know, I'm not good enough or, or, or I could never keep it up. But do you see who God calls? He calls all of us because we all get hungry and thirsty and he says to all of us, come without money. I'll pay. Jesus has paid already. He served you and me. That's, that was last week. That's the, he, he's done it in our place. He's died in our place to pay for our wrong, to, to bring us back. He's done it all. So God says, come. Other people hesitate from becoming Christians or from really committing themselves to Jesus because they think, well, the Christian faith, is it, you know, is it really worth it? Is it really worth everything? 
After all, we are following a leader who did become a servant, who, who was killed. But if we've read through Isaiah, the reason that Jesus did that is that we are in a spiritual war zone. That is the world around us. That's the world where devastating things happen when human evil is in the ascendancy. It's a spiritual war zone that you and I live in. That's why Jesus had to come as a servant in order to die. That's why he had to rise again victorious, is to win that spiritual battle. It's why following him will be costly. And yet, verse 2, even now, here and now, in spite of the cost, to come to know God is to eat what is good, to delight in the richest affair. It's what your and my souls were made for and what we hunger and thirst for. And verse 2, anything else, any other goal, any other God will cost you everything and it will not satisfy you. So come, says God, come. We might be asking though, how? How do we do that? This is obviously a metaphor, isn't it? Eating and drinking. What, what does it refer to? What do we actually do? Well, verse 2, listen. Verse 3, give ear, listen. How do we eat and drink spiritually? How do we uh, enjoy the richest affair in life? Through drinking in what God says, through feeding on his words. We are what we eat, so eat the word. Obviously not literally. But believe what God says and follow what God says. Uh, as many will know, um, I, uh, at the end of the summer, I went on a, uh, a diet to lose some weight. And that meant changing some things in my life. It meant changing what I was eating, saying no to some things that beforehand had been uh, uh, eating all the time and choosing instead some healthier things. It meant listening to different voices as I did that. So instead of the internal voice, which kept on saying, Steve, you're a middle-aged man. Come on, be realistic. You're never going to change now. Instead of listening to that voice... I listened instead to, uh, first of all, my sister and my brother-in-law who are already on this thing and, and losing some weight. And then I got the book and I listened to what the book said was the goal of the whole thing. And, and these were the steps you took to uh, get from where you were to uh, losing some weight. I believe that uh, it was worth it, tentatively at first, but enough to start. I believed it, I followed it, and it got me to where I was... Uh, hoping to get to. And that is the sort of thing that is meant here by listening and feeding on what God says. Listen to God. Listen to him instead of the internal voice that says, oh, I'll never change. It's too late for me now. Listen to him instead of the crowd that says, oh, come and do this. Come and eat some of this food. It looks good on the packet. Listen to God. Feed on his word. That's what Isaiah is saying to you and to me. So question, in a world full of opinions, what makes God stand out, God's word stand out as so uh, different, as so worth listening to and trusting in a wholehearted way so we're fully committed to Jesus and whatever he says and wherever he leads. Well, if you flip the page, at least in my Bible, and find verse 9, you find there a description, and um, it's a description and saying, look up, probably not literally right now at the ceiling, but go outside later and look up and at the sky, or, or go out at night and look up and at the stars, and um, do a comparison between you and me and our creator God, the one who made everything and everyone. And what God says in verse 9 makes sense, doesn't it? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. There is just a category difference between God's thoughts, words and ideas 
and, and yours and mine. It's even stronger than the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, when it says the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. When God says or does something, even if what God says seems a bit, oh, that's not how you would have done it, seems a bit foolish to our way of seeing things, listen, God has said it. There's a category, category difference between his words and my words and your words. It will be wiser, because God has said it, than our so-called wisdom. Just like choosing to save the world through his own son being crucified. None of us would have thought of that or even imagined it, even if that wasn't it precisely what God had done. And Isaiah points in this second half of the chapter to a daily reminder of this principle of God's word uh, all around us. He says, look at the natural world. Um, verse 10 talks about the rain and snow coming down from heaven, um, watering the earth, producing life. And then verse 11 explains, well, that's how God's word works too. God isn't some sort of divine watchmaker who wound up the universe at the beginning and now sits on the sidelines observing. He continually speaks into the world to sustain it and to shape it. And he specifically speaks to human beings, to you and to me, through prophets like Isaiah and through his son Jesus. That's what we have in the Bible. That is his word to you and me and we are called to listen to him. And it should give us confidence in what God says that just like the rain and the snow accomplish God's purpose of sustaining life on earth, so, verse 11, the word that God speaks to people will not return to him empty, but will accomplish what he desires and achieve the purpose for which he sent it, including saving everyone who puts their faith in Jesus, you and me. So our call-up papers from Isaiah 55 say come, and they say listen. Verses 12 and 13 at the end of the chapter give us a wonderful vision of where that leads to joy, peace, God's everlasting kingdom. And all of those things are picked up by Jesus. I'll give you one example. Uh, John chapter 7 records him teaching at the annual Feast of Tabernacles. And during that, uh, that festival, that feast, there was a water-pouring ceremony. Uh, on the last and greatest day of the feast. And that was the moment that Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. The kingdom of God is wide open through Jesus. He's paid for it all by his death. You don't need any spiritual or moral capital to come. So come, says God. Listen to Jesus. Listen to God's word. And as we consider our response to this, Let's head back over the page, as I say in my Bible, to the uh, middle of what we read, the heart of it, and verse 6, and hear the note of urgency. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Just like uh, people uh, who were on holiday at the uh, beginning of the first lockdown, uh, they were faced with a deadline, weren't they? You've got to get back. Uh, before the border shuts or else you're going to get shut out and it meant for some people a mad scramble for flights and ferries for other people they did get stuck and they had weeks on end in uh, quarantine or in a ho hotel somewhere in that sort of a way verse 1 to 5 where God is speaking uh, verse 8 to 13 where God is speaking in the middle of them Verses 6 and 7, Isaiah chimes in and he urges us 
to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call on him while he is near. Come back while you can, he says, before the door closes. Some people uh, hesitate on the brink of becoming Christians or hold back from really committing themselves because they think, oh, I'll do it later. Isaiah says, do it now while you can, before the door closes, while God is near. And he's already told us why God is so good and why we want to do that, to come and enjoy peace and joy and the richest affair. Repent and believe is how Jesus put it. Seek and forsake is how Isaiah puts it here. Or turn, verse 7, which is the same idea as repenting. So um, during lockdown part one, I had a uh, a conversation with um, uh, a policeman. I was uh, cycling uh, towards uh, Hyde Park. I was nearly there, uh, just within sight of it. I came uh, down the road, and it was just over there to my right, and the one-way system said, go to the left. And, but it was just over there, and it's all the way, long way around. And so I just you know, took a bit of a naughty shortcut and went off to the right. There were, you, know, you remember the lockdown first time around. There were hardly any cars on the road, and, and so I was nearly there, and then there was a car coming towards me. So oh, I better stop. So I stopped against the curb out the way. And the car slowed down and stopped next to me and wound down the window. And so began my conversation with the policeman. It ended with me saying, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm very sorry. I will go the right way next time. I'm terribly sorry. And for some reason, that was enough for the policeman, probably because he had much better things to do. Um, And uh, the, the car sped off. And so I thought, well, okay, I think I got away with that, got back on my bike, and, oh, I actually did cycle about two revolutions of the pedals the wrong way towards Hyde Park, because I was nearly there. And then I thought, I had a qualm of conscience from the Lord, I think, to say, hang on a minute, I've just told the policeman that I'm going to turn around, I'm going to U-turn, I'm going to repent. And so I did. And I cycled all the way around the long way. And I have been doing that since then. You'll be glad to know. That's repenting. That's turning. That's forsaking the wrong. Turning back to God and seeking him. Repenting is a very practical thing. It's not particularly necessarily just, well, it's not Primarily, that's the word I was looking for in my notes. It's not primarily saying sorry or feeling sorry. It's that U-turn like I had to do. And then keep having to do to go the right way, not the wrong way. That's repenting. That's what you and I are called to, is to forsake everything we know to be wrong, forsaking wicked ways, verse 7, and unrighteous thoughts, and turning to the Lord, knowing that he will have mercy. He will freely pardon because Jesus has paid. So it may be that today is a now moment for you, actually for all of us in this season, in this second lockdown we're going into. A now moment either to respond to God for the first time or for all of us to seek God, to pursue him, to forsake all that's wrong in our lives, the unrighteous thoughts, the wicked ways, and to get serious and wholehearted for the God who loves us and who sent his son to die for us and bring us back. Normal life, I say a now moment because normal life is hectic for many, many people, even the new normal was pretty kind of full on, wasn't it? With so much time on the, on the screen. But for the next month, I think, from my calculations, I think all of us are going to have some spare time that we didn't have before. Will we seek the Lord while he may be found? Will we? Isaiah is saying, do it. He's so good. He wants to pardon. He wants to have mercy. Will we talk to him in prayer today? 
responding to this, to what Isaiah is saying in chapter 55, and then keeping on in prayer each day, talking to him about what we're going through, about all the, all the highs, all the lows. God loves you. He wants to hear from you and me. Let's talk to him. And will we listen to what he says? Will we keep listening to the Bible, uh, using that app on our phone, reading it each day, trusting what he says, turning away from what's wrong, and following what he says in life? Will we come to Jesus, the one who has living water for our souls, that will satisfy in the deepest way possible, that will give us the significance and the security we crave? Come, says the living God, all who are thirsty. Come without money and without cost. Listen that you may live. Seek the Lord while he is near. Amen.